GameRanks presents 10 Nintendo Entertainment System facts you probably didn't know. There were home game consoles before it, but the NES really kickstarted it all. So let's get talking about it, starting off with number 10. The NES game Castlevania II, Simon's Quest is credited as being the first game with multiple endings. The game had three different endings, one which you see is determined by how long it took to complete the game and how many times you pressed continue. All three are variations of the same ending but with different twists. This was a big deal at the time. The endings were very time specific. You got the bad ending if you completed the game in 15 days or more, you got the normal ending if you completed the game within 8 to 14 days, and you got the good ending if you beat the game in 7 days or less. So basically the game rewarded speedy players. The many many games that have multiple endings nowadays can thank the NES and Castlevania 2 for that. At number 9, Nintendo originally wanted Yoshi to be rideable in the NES era Mario games, but couldn't due to the hardware limitations. It wasn't until Super Nintendo that Mario gained his companion. Yeah, you heard that right, Yoshi could have had his big moment in the original Mario games, but unfortunately, he had to sit on the bench and wait his turn. And that's totally fine because riding Yoshi was totally worth the wait, and one of the best aspects of the Super Nintendo Mario games. Not to mention Yoshi's theme. At number 8, did you know that there's a Japan-only NES game called Holy Diver where you play as the famous electric heavy metal guitarist Randy Rhodes? In the game, your father is Emperor Ronnie James Dio. Yes, Dio himself. And your mentor is Ozzy Osbourne. In the finale of the game, you fuse with your brother Zach Wilde. Yes, this is a real playable video game. Why it didn't make its way to the States, I have no idea. And the word on the street is that the game was actually really, really good. It had tons of boss battles and was apparently incredibly challenging. It was basically like a heavy metal rock version of Castlevania, and it was also available on the Famicom. And now after making this video, I kind of really want to play it. At number 7, the largest NES game is Dragon Quest IV. Dragon Quest IV took up a whopping 1 megabyte of space for its ROM. This is in stark contrast to most games at a time, which averaged in size between 128 and 384 kilobytes, but could go as small as 8 kilobytes. That smallest 8 kilobyte game was called Galaxium. But that 1 megabyte Dragon Quest IV was a huge deal at the time. That was almost revolutionary. 1 megabyte equals a million bytes. That's a lot of bytes. At number 6, Nintendo made a disabled friendly NES controller called the Hands Free. I don't really know if that name is offensive or not, but regardless, rather than using traditional buttons, the A and B inputs were activated by blowing and sucking, and the directional buttons were used by a mouth-operated joystick. This controller idea was pretty revolutionary for the time, and apparently took some cues from how Stephen Hawking and how some other severely disabled people operated their computers. The Hands Free was released in 1989 for $120, and has since become a rare collector's item, fetching almost $600. At number 5, there's a Where's Waldo game for the NES. Yeah, remember Where's Where's Waldo? That stupid asshole in the sweater that you had to find? Well, back in the day, he was super popular and he had a Nintendo game. However, due to the low fidelity of the 8-bit graphics the console was capable of, almost all the mobs in the game looked like Waldo, making the game almost impossible to beat and thus rated as one of the worst games of all time. You had one job making this game. It's called Where's Waldo? Make it so you can find him. Are you kidding me? Why is this even a thing? Also, one other stupid fact from this awful game, in the medium and hard modes, Waldo would change color to make it more challenging to find him in the pictured levels, because screw you. At number 4, the Nintendo Helpline continued to aid and service the NES consoles for over 24 years. It wasn't until 2007 that the company stopped servicing the consoles due to a lack of available parts. At number 3, did you know Sharp produced a television with a built-in Nintendo Entertainment System? This TV was dubbed the Sharp Nintendo Television, and it had a limited run in North America in 89, but it was sold in Japan for 6 years, from 1983 to 1989. It was even followed up by a Super Nintendo version in 1990, called the Super Famicom Naizo TV S41, or they just called it the S41 for short. I think this is pretty crazy because that sounds a hell of a lot ahead of its time. We don't have any TVs today that have consoles built in, but we do have smart TVs. Where do you think they got that idea from? Either way, it was a really slick idea, and it's always interesting to look at the Nintendo of the past, who was willing to work with other electronics manufacturers so much. This is not the first example of Nintendo working with other companies to better their products. Take a look at the Japan-exclusive GameCube that had a DVD disk drive built in. At number 2, here's a fun fact. The NES light gun, the one that was packaged with Duck Hunt, well, it worked by detecting flashes of light on the TV screen. So basically, when the trigger was pulled, the console would play a single frame of all black followed by another black frame with a section of white where the target was, and it would figure out where the gun was pointing based on that. Because of the way this worked, it only worked on CRTs. 
I don't know about you, but I know when I was a kid, I thought the light gun was absolutely magic. Now figuring out the science of how exactly it worked, it's pretty simple and it totally makes sense. It's actually pretty crafty. I just wish the game would really register when you try to shoot the dog because I always used to shoot the dog because I hated his face. That smug bastard. At number one, Nintendo almost released an add-on for the NES that would have allowed users to design patterns in-game and print those patterns out with a Nintendo-branded knitting machine. Yeah, if that doesn't sound insanely Nintendo, I don't know if you know what Nintendo is all about. While the Nintendo knitting machine was never released anywhere, a pattern editing software was released in Japan in 1986 for the Famicom. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine sitting in front of your TV with your Nintendo designing knitting patterns? Maybe making Christmas sweaters out of your Nintendo? That's the dumbest thing I've ever Hurt. And you know what? I want to live in a world where that was a thing. We also got a bonus for you guys. European and North American NES consoles featured an early type of DRM in the form of 10 NES lockout system. Yes, apparently DRM wasn't devised by the evil game publishers of today. The system was a safeguard in place to prevent unauthorized software from being released on the machine. All software required Nintendo's approval and licensing fees. It had to have that little mark on the game case, Nintendo's seal of quality. Nintendo president at the time, Hiroshi Yamachi, said in 1986, Atari collapsed because they gave too much freedom to third-party developers, and the market was swarmed with rubbish games. And thank God for that control that they exacted, because most Nintendo games were pretty darn good, and it turned out to be a good console that survived a while. So guys, those were 10 facts about the NES we think you might not have known. If you do have some fun facts about Nintendo's best console, let us know in the comments below. And while you're at it, let us know what your favorite Nintendo console really is. If you did learn a thing or two, click the like button, because that really helps us out. And if you are new, subscribe, because we put out videos every single day. But thanks for watching, and we'll see you guys next time.